Good morning. Thank you, Ambassador Moose, for the warm welcome. I'd like to thank USIP and the Resolve Network for hosting this very important event today. And I'm very proud of CSO's role in supporting the Resolve Network and establishing the Resolve Network in 2015. And I look forward to continuing to support the important work that you do uh, to expand your resources and capabilities. As we address the critical issue of countering violent extremism, it's reassuring to know that this administration is showing its priority to spare no effort to preserve the safety and security of the United States. When President Trump released the, the National Strategy for Counterterrorism in October 2018, he affirmed his commitment to do whatever is necessary to protect the nation, especially when it comes to terrorism. The National Strategy for Counterterrorism, which is informed by our national security strategy and this administration's priorities, is guided by U.S. national interests. It recognizes that the nature of terrorist threats have changed. They are more complex, fluid, and diversified across the globe. These changes warrant a more expansive approach to address the full spectrum of terrorist threats and a broad range of non-military means to counter terrorism and violent extremism. There are three key efforts that I'd like to focus on today. The first is prevention, secondly, partnerships, and third, targeted programs. First, the National Counterterrorism Strategy recognizes that while we have built a robust counterterrorism capabilities, we still need prevention architecture to thwart terrorist radicalization and recruitment. This effort begins with developing and implementing national and local action plans to increase civil society's role in prevention. It also includes a renewed emphasis on combating ideology that foments terrorism. To this end, the United States is empowering government officials, community leaders, and religious figures to develop locally resonant counter-narratives to dissuade would-be recruits from turning to violent extremism. Our second focus is on building partnerships. We not only seek to address the specific dynamics of radicalization and recruitment, but also to enable partnerships with the United States over the long term. This effort requires building local capacities and mitigating the grievances that terrorists seek to exploit through local conditions. Resolve is an important partner in these efforts. My Bureau, the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, is currently working with Resolve to train local researchers to produce empirical analysis for municipal leaders in the Western Balkans associated with the Strong Cities Network. This network is a global network of mayors and practitioners that are united in building social cohesion and community resilience against violent extremism. We also have supported Resolve to train local researchers in Bangladesh who conducted analysis and communicated it to policymakers. This result, this effort resulted in the Bangladesh police commissioning a specific study to improve community policing. Third, we're, we are committed to better targeting our CVE programs. This effort reflects this administration's priority to focus judiciously on using taxpayer dollars in all of our foreign assistance programs to ensure greater accountability and to realize more effective outcomes. We are making sure that our efforts and our programs are tied to clear policy objectives and that we need to measure success and impact. As management guru Peter Drucker once said, famously said, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. For instance, in the past, CVE focused on poverty and counter-messaging, despite the fact that there is no clear evidence that poor economic conditions or terrorist propaganda alone are sufficient drivers of violent extremism. It is critical that we approach CVE with sound data-driven analysis. This means generating more empirical data and research that is grounded in local realities. CSO is at the forefront of this effort at the Department of State, working closely with the Bureau of Counterterrorism and our other partners by conducting planning strategies, designing programs, and monitoring and evaluation. 
Our staff has also deployed across the globe to conduct analysis and coordinate CVE activities with other U.S. government agencies, regional partners, and local stakeholders. For instance, our CVE baseline research that we are conducting right now program in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kenya, Malaysia, Niger, and the Philippines establishes baseline indicators for violent extremism and community resiliencies. This allows us to design more effective programs, monitor the changing VE landscape, and measure the impact of our CVE engagements. I'd like to share an example from Kenya of how we are operationalizing these three key strategic priorities of prevention, partnerships, and targeted programs. In 2013, Kenyan security forces responded to the Westgate Mall attack in Nairobi with the arbitrary detention of Somali men in the East Lane neighborhood and elsewhere, which increased communal tensions. Five and a half years later, in late 2018, when al-Shabaab attacked the Dusit D2 hotel, law enforcement and community members worked together to channel communal tensions through dialogue and nonviolent action. This effort prevented the terrorists from achieving their objective to polarize the community and gain new recruits, while giving voice to valid frustrations of the community. This example also has policy implications. The Kenyan government realized that community engagement and non-securitized approaches can help defeat terrorism and prevent radicalization to violence, and improved its approach to CVE. Since then, the government of Kenya developed national and country-led action plans on CVE, which are focused on dialogues between the government and local community members. This CVE effort is also built on a long-standing partnership between the United States and Kenya. This partnership has further enabled more targeted programming based on understanding the specifics of localities and building the capacity of local communities to effectively engage with security forces. Additionally, building trust and dialogue between police and the communities they serve in Eastleigh has enabled a constructive feedback loop. For example, community members voice concerns over group profiling to police leadership while their visits to the police barracks widened their understandings that the police face. In one case, instead of ignoring a tip from an unfamiliar community member, a police responded to a local contact's report that someone unknown to the community was handing out cash and religious materials to local youth, a possible warning sign for recruitment. All of these positive engagements are built on sound research and evidence-based analysis. And they reinforce three key points and findings. First, deeper and more effective engagement between police forces and local communities is critical to breaking the life cycle of radicalization. Second, a rise in security force abuses and state-sponsored violence against civilians correlates with a rise in violent activity, including the emergence of new violent extremist organizations. Three, these programs send the message to governments that CV is an essential component of an effective counterterrorism strategy. While CT, counterterrorism, can stop imminent threats, CVE can build societal resiliencies to prevent, counter, and recover from these threats. I'd like to conclude by highlighting three questions that, that I would like to, to consider, for you to consider during your discussions today that can help us translate your cutting edge ideas into action to counter radicalization and recruitment by violent extremists. First, how can we effectively measure success and impact when we're addressing countering violent and preventing violent extremism? Secondly, how can we better understand local relationships to enhance societal resiliencies to violent extremism? And third, how can we bridge the gap between securitized approaches to community-led and community-led approaches to prevent radicalization to violent extremism. I hope today's events brings fresh insights into the challenges and opportunities that we, we face. I applaud Resolve's efforts to make research more relevant and accessible to policymakers. And I thank you again for the critical work that you're all doing to support our efforts to counter violent extremism and terrorism. I will now turn it over to Leanne to facilitate the rest of the discussion, but again, thank you very much for sponsoring this important event. Thank you.